was designed by Ray Canera uh, probably when he was 17 or 18 years of age and completed by about his 20th birthday in 1966 because we, we got pictures of the car from Ray with the plates and it was that summer without the body paint being done that he boldly drove with his mother with an open top car from St. Petersburg, Florida to Los Angeles, California, which is a very long way, about 2,800 miles if I'm not mistaken. I first of all bought the car because I thought it was going to be an easy restoration. And when it was painted in faded red, you couldn't see many of the numerous curves which we were to spend hours and hours and hours restoring later. Once I bought the car, I started to get interested in the design features of clearly what was a wedge car. Um, it was after about a year's worth of research, and we really shopped the concept around to people who are true experts in either automotive design, pebble beach judges, and so forth. And the conclusion was that this is the earliest full-size representation of a fully wedge-themed car, where the notion is, of course, that the entire car itself is wedge-shaped. And as a sidebar, straight up, is that wedge elements have been in car design since 1898 and have always been there. So you've had fins and wedges and so forth, but we're talking about the wedge car movement of design. Most known, the kinds of cars that one would think about are the early Lamborghini Countach, there are the Lancia Stratus, the Lancia uh, Stratus predecessor, which is a concept car, extremely radical wedge design, many of which were by Marcello Gandini, the Italian designer. And he designed a car called the Auto Bianchi that was unveiled at the Turin Motor Show, I think in 1969. And the similarities with the design of the front of the car are uncanny. But that's a very famous car. This car didn't sort of see the light of day after the early to mid 1970s until it was found in about 2016 by Jeff Hacker, once again super sleuth. Um, but I've subsequently written a book and it's online and available for free, The Origins of West Car De Wedge Car Design, and takes through the whole wedge car story and then starts to start to look at some of the lesser known designers that happen to be actually all of them went to the art center. Um, but Ray Canera, I think, uh, did a phenomenal job with the proportions of this car and integrating the curvature. And there's curves everywhere, but you, you're stunned initially by the wedge shape, but the complexity of the car as a whole is very sophisticated. If you can squeeze through that space, point out one feature. I don't know how well it will come out on camera, but this piece here was missing when we got the car. So we knew we wanted something to represent the interior shape, but there's three dimensions here. So there's a, a rise in the curve here. You've got the curves behind the seats and this angle is also offset. Um, thanks to Rob Hernandez for figuring that out, he did a great job. Well, so you kind of already mentioned that it was, <laughs> it turned out to be a little bit more of a project than you had mm -hmm. initially anticipated with how it appeared. So talk to me a little bit about some of the 
other challenges you had yeah. in addition to the condition of the body? So the, the biggest mechanical challenge and the one that we absolutely swore that we were going to get right is with 1960s tire technology, the car was actually pointed up. It was not, it didn't have the correct rake. So fortunately, there are tires available today, which is currently on the car for display. They're mismatched, but we wanted to get the right size. If I'd wanted to, I could have used race car tires and got the same effect. But really, this is not something that I'm going to drive that many miles. I have driven it. I've driven it at 60 miles an hour. I don't find that there's any problem with the tires. Um, and I've also driven a race car with mismatched tires. And I will, I will tell you at 130 miles an hour, you do know that there's a mismatch. Um, so we, we've, we dropped the front of the car. We used dropped spindles, one thing. We lowered the profile of the tires. Then we had the, comf the issue of, well, the wheels are sticking out because we switched to disc brakes, which possibly in hindsight, I may eventually move back uh, from that, but I'd have to have a new set of wheels made to take the benefit from them. Um, anyway, we played around with offsets of the kind of wheels that we needed and I went to a steel wheel manufacturer that I'd previously used before and the advice was, was to use what he called military wheels which are very very plain and I was extremely pleased with the effect because I didn't want the wheels to detract from the shape of the body and they do a great job in that respect uh, so one of the challenges was for me to get my legs in the car the carburetor which is still here which we intentionally left it visible used to be where the mirror was that's literally up here so that meant that the engine was even further back along with the bell housing so for me to get in the car we moved the engine around multiple times until we got enough clearance that i could drive and i and can quite comfortably with a very small diameter wheel, which is not much weight in the car. Um, the second generation of engine that Ray Canera used was a 350 Chevy. We wanted to go back and date stamp the car prior to 1966. So the engine that's in this car is what originally he started with, which was a 283 out of a 1958 Chevrolet Impala station wagon as was the majority of the chassis and rear axle. So that was kind of the basis of his project car. Really? So the chassis is based on a station wagon? 1958 Chevrolet Impala station wagon. That's really shocking given how short the car appears though. So there must have yeah. been a significant amount of modification. Yeah, so more credit to a young kid really doing something probably for the first time he got a lot right you know um i was still thinking about how to take wheels off the car at that age and how old was ray at the time probably 18 17 18 because he to get this car ready to drive to california around his 20th birthday was, we assume he started it probably at least 18 months to two years before that and whether he penned the design is still in high school. I, I've lost track of that particular piece of knowledge. Ray is still around. Uh, when we finished the car, Ray found me through my website, guydirkin.com, and sent me kind of a thumbs up, you know, great job, thanks for preserving the car, etc. So I'm pleased that he's pleased. That's great. Yeah. Well, you, it's kind of funny. You have um, a couple cars. I know Merrill didn't design the S1, but you do have Merrill in your life who was co-founder of Victorus. And then you were able to actually track down and restore yet another car that you had some communication with the yes. original designer and owner right. of. So that's pretty unique. I mean, that's not really right. common in the classic car hobby, especially the older yep. the cars get and the older the designers get. Yep. But Merrill's probably in better shape than all of us and yes. has... I don't know, Meryl, you're what, 92 now? 92? Well, I'm 33. You're, I would say you're in better shape than I am. <laughs> I'm, I'm trying, but damn, <laughs> you get around better than most folks.
And I love the script. So tell me a little bit about how the script came to be for the logo. Is that uh, Dan Palatnik? Is yes, that it was. okay? Yeah. Great. Um, we had other, we had ideas. We looked at a. In fact, I think I bought one. A C from a particular era of Corvair, which we were thinking of using as a centerpiece hood badge. But I, I gave Dan the, the, the idea, could you help us come up with what you would you do? And he tried several versions and then eventually came with this swooping C, which has wedge elements to it. And then the, the rest of the word kind of just flowed after that. And as soon as I saw it, I knew it was the right one. <laughs> it was a slam dunk, slam dunk on that. Right, so I just want to get some... It's actually showing up fairly well, showing how curvy this thing really is. Yeah, you're probably the first person to be able to take the curvature in the light that it's needed to show it. I don't know if you can get the camera down level with the side pipe. I look, believe I can, yeah. And look at the side balance. Even the side balance has curves front and aft. And it's not that they weren't finished. Right. It's intentional. And when I was looking at the car last week without the Victress in the garage, I sat in the chair and it just struck me that that's a premeditated design element that initially I'd overlooked. There's a lot of things I initially overlooked. You know, going back to the start of the video this evening, is this was a very wedgy car, looked dead easy to fix. <laughs> uh, and a year of uh, Rob uh, Hernandez's craft work on the body, it was, uh, it's been, Done really well. Yeah, the color really helps you see all of that. It's, I Le think. it's Lexus Atomic Silver. And I drove around, I looked at a number of different silvers, and some of them were close, but this one I thought was the best for this purpose. So I remember Rob doing quite the engineering job on the hinges. Is it possible to see the hood in action open up? Uh, or is it too close to the Devon Jr.? <laughs> no, I think, we can, I think we can open it up. You're gonna have to put the camera down and sure. edit it in for a second. No problem. That's a very heavy hood. Mm -hmm. Have you seen this open before, Merrill? I assume you have, right? What is that? Have you seen this open before? I, I'm sure I must have. Yeah, Rob is quite the talented guy. <laughs> I think the uh, origin of the bases of hinges was from the Sebring canopy kit car. Okay. The whole roof section moved the same way as this hood did. And then Rob worked in the double springs because the first, with only one set, it wasn't enough. <laughs> I love this now. It's a, it's a great feature now. It's what? It's a good feature. Yeah. It shows it's a, it's a real eye catcher. Yeah, it's funny because a lot of the times you open a hood at a car show and it kind of detracts from the design of the overall car, but this actually <laughs> almost adds to it, being able to see it in yeah. action. Yeah. Yeah, it does. Yeah, there's no loss by opening the hood. What is that? Uh, an oil transmission, oh, transmission cooler. Ah, okay. Yeah. Oh, this fin guy across the, yeah. the front here. I get out of your way. Yeah. No, you're you're great, Merrill. Happy to have you in it. Might be uh, good. To That's what I was thinking. Yeah. Merrill, if you could move now. Is it a two-man job to put it down to? Yeah, and that's one of the reasons I keep not charging the battery. I will charge it while I leave, leave it up. About ready? 
Hey guys, Mike and Undiscovered Classics here. Hope you guys are enjoying the video. Thanks for subscribing and following the channel. Uh, it really means a lot when you guys comment and share our videos. And to that end, a lot of the analytics we're seeing on the back end here in the YouTube Creator Studio is that we've got a lot of people watching videos, but not necessarily a lot subscribing. So I know it's annoying and everybody asks for it, but if you get the chance, subscribe to the channel, like, maybe even share the video, and uh, we'd love to interact with you in the comments. So appreciate it and enjoy.